I'm very sorry I couldn't join you in person to celebrate the 70th anniversary of Relationships Australia and to participate with the other panellists in this discussion about the issue of loneliness in Australian society, but I'm happy to be here courtesy of this video. I think the deepest truth about human beings also happens to be the sweetest truth about us and the noblest truth about us, and that is that we are by nature social beings. We absolutely need each other. We depend utterly on neighbourhoods, communities, families, groups of all kinds to nurture us, uh, to protect us, and even to give us a sense of our own identity. We talk a lot about personal identity. In fact, we talk a lot of rubbish about personal identity as though it's something you could work out in isolation by gazing at your navel or uh, staring into the mirror or rushing off on a weekend workshop to discover yourself. Don't ever do that. If you want to know who you are, you look into the faces of the people who love you or the people you work with or the people in your neighbourhood, the people who'll put up with you and most particularly the people who need you. That's who you are. We can only make sense of ourselves because we belong to this species. We can only make sense of ourselves in a human context. That's why, for example, in our criminal justice system, the harshest punishment we can think of is solitary confinement. Because for herd animals like us, the bitterest punishment is to be cut off from the herd, which doesn't mean that we don't need and enjoy periods of isolation. We all need time on our own. But what we need that time for is to replenish our resources for the very challenging task of belonging to a social species. Now, if you bear that in mind and think about contemporary Australia, it's very clear what our major social problem has become. If you look at most of the ways in which contemporary Australian society is changing, what you realise is that those changes cumulatively are taking us away from our sense of belonging to groups, communities, neighbourhoods, and our sense of connectedness with each other. In fact, one of the two most significant things to be said about contemporary Australia is that we're more socially fragmented than we've ever been. Uh, and I can justify that very easily by reminding you of things we all know about ourselves. Our households are shrinking. Every fourth household, and it, and it will very soon be every third household, contains just one person. That's the fastest growing household type in Australia. That doesn't mean that every third or fourth household contains a lonely person, but it does mean that in every third or fourth household around Australia, the risk of loneliness and a sense of social isolation is greatly increased. Between 35 and 40% of contemporary marriages are ending in divorce. That's a very fragmenting phenomenon, of course, and not just for the couples that are splitting and for their families and their friendship groups, but for any kids who might be involved in the marriage that's come to an end. And while we're talking about kids, uh, another uh, strange, perhaps, factor to mention on this list of contributors to our social fragmentation is the falling birth rate. Uh, any parent knows that if you move into a new neighbourhood, it's usually the kids who act as a sort of social lubricant. They get to know the other kids and gradually the families get to know each other. The connections usually begin in the school playground or on the bus or on the soccer field. Uh, so when, as we have now, uh, we're experiencing the lowest birth rate in our history. We're producing, relative to total population, the smallest generation of children we've ever produced. That means that that social lubricant is in shorter supply and we have to compensate. We are compensating, of course, by uh, while the birth rate crashes, the rate of pet ownership is going through the roof. 
And that's how some people compensate. You know that they're child substitutes because they're giving them human names more and more. I recently met a dog called Ian, and I thought that was a bit of a funny name for a dog, but I certainly, re certainly realised that Ian was a child substitute. So there's another factor. But what about our increased busyness? We're working longer hours. People uh, who work in occupations where they're accessible via information technology say that in a way they're never away from work. There are always emails and text messages and other things to be attended to. And when we're busier, of course, uh, by the end of the working week, if it ever ends, we have much less time and much less energy available for the business of nurturing the local neighbourhood. So our busyness tends to isolate us from each other, as of course does our almost addictive attachment to our IT devices. They seem to be connecting us, but it's a paradox because while they're connecting us, they're also making it easier than ever for us to stay apart from each other. And there is a huge qualitative difference between face-to-face -face communication between humans who are present to each other and communication, or we should really just call it data transfer, that happens via information technology. Uh, so you put all of those things together, add to that our increasing mobility. We're moving house on average once every six years. And of course, we're a drive-in, drive-out society. We tend to go everywhere by car, uh, footpath, traffic, uh, uh, falls away. All of those things contribute to uh, more sense of isolation, let, less sense of belonging to stable and cohesive neighbourhoods. Now, in the light of what I was saying about the nature of our species, think about what is likely to happen in a society that's going through those sort of upheavals, those sort of social changes, taking us in the direction of becoming less socially cohesive and more socially fragmented. Pretty obviously, what you would expect for a social species is that greater social fragmentation would lead to more anxiety, more mental disturbance, more restlessness, perhaps even more depression. And that, of course, is precisely what's happened, not only here, but around most Western societies that we'd compare ourselves with. So I said the first big fact about contemporary Australia was that we've become more socially fragmented. The second big fact about contemporary Australia is that we are experiencing an epidemic of mental illness and specifically an epidemic of anxiety. But of course, those two facts are really just one fact. If you do become more socially fragmented, you will have an epi epidemic of anxiety. Well, our panel is going to talk about these and other matters and their implications. But let me just complete my little contribution uh, to this event by saying there clearly is something we can do about this. We are not uh, simply the hapless victims of all these things I've been describing. In fact, we're active participants in them. We make these social changes happen. And therefore, it seems to me we have to own the epidemic of anxiety. It's our epidemic, even if we ourselves are not suffering from it, we've contributed to the kind of society that leads to this epidemic. Beyond Blue told us last year, two million Australians were suffering from a diagnosable anxiety disorder. Add to that depression and other forms of associated mental illness, and it's a very big chunk in any one year. So what could we do about it? Well, there'll be many suggestions, I'm sure, coming from the panelists uh, here. But let me just say, I think the critical word that could transform the whole thing, the critical word that would capture the strategy that's going to solve the problem of the link between social fragmentation and high anxiety is the word compassion. We're going to have to learn that for human communities to thrive and prosper, or perhaps even to survive, certainly in the case of local neighbourhoods. We need them, but we have to remember this beautifully symmetrical fact about human nature, that, that while we need these communities to sustain us, 
these communities need us to sustain them. We have to engage. We have to connect. We have to be the kind of people who, in a, in a compassionate frame of mind, having adopted a mental discipline that says, I will treat every encounter with fellow human beings uh, with kindness and with respect, because I know that's the only way to deal with fellow members of this species if we're all going to survive and get along. Uh, all that means in practical terms is you'd never pass someone on the footpath and fail to smile and say hello. You'd never find yourself saying, as so many people in our major cities now do say, we don't know our neighbours. You'd go and knock on the door and make sure you do know them. You'd never say, I feel a bit of a stranger in my own street, because you'd organise a little street party or something to get people together. You'd never be able to say, gosh, someone in our street died in their house and no one knew for two weeks, as has happened on many occasions in major cities of Australia. You wouldn't allow that to happen because you'd be the kind of person who, recognising that you are a social being who belongs to this species and that you need a neighbourhood to sustain you, you'd be one of those people who's alert to what's going on in the neighbourhood. If there's someone a frail elderly person living near the end of the street, well, you'd know uh, to call in occasionally and make sure everything's okay. Can I give you a hand with your shopping or put the bin out or anything just to maintain contact and to give that person uh, the feeling that they are being taken seriously, our deepest human need, by the way, to be taken seriously, uh, and that they are not socially isolated because someone in the street is looking out for them. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's not even very hard. It's just a matter of making the commitment to the idea that every human encounter will be handled kindly and with respect, that every person I meet in any context is a person who I'll take seriously and that I'll seize every opportunity available to me to join a choir, a community garden, a current affairs discussion, of anything that will connect me with the no local neighbourhood, not just because it'll be good for me, nothing gets my anxiety level down like the exercise of compassion, but also because I know it'll be good for the community. The only way to maintain the health of the community is to connect, to participate, to engage, and above all, to look out for the hazard of social isolation.